All right, come on, Anya. Good. 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 All right. Good. All right. Good. Okay. Good. All right. Just stay right here. On it. Stay. Good girl. Now, end of March today, we're out here in BC, 2017. I got my Swedish Jam Sandania. I got my new stud dog, Mon. I got Tekla, my Norwegian elk hound. I got Mon is her son and Luna is her daughter. And Tora is uh, a sister, half sister to Luna and Mon. And Tora is a daughter of Dakota. Dakota is the father of those two pups. And he's also bred to tackle one more time. So there's, she's got a belly full of pups coming May 15th. Now, I usually do these videos and I kind of have uh, found out that I through my daughter that I kind of just uh, talk about the same thing. I talk about the ancient genetics, the fact that we're an old world breeder, those sort of things, but uh, she said I need to uh, kind of expand on that a bit because it might not, not everybody understands what an old world breeder is. And uh, when I say I got extremely good dogs, you can believe that very easily. You just got to look at the dogs and you know that. So, um, you also got to believe that I got a fat head about my dogs. So, that, that you can believe that as well, because I think they're the greatest. But when it comes to genetics, I'm not a genetic researcher. I'm not up on all the latest genetic material and research and studies. So you can take what I say on genetics with a grain of salt. But what I do know is that since I was 10 years old, I've been involved with livestock and purebred livestock and uh, raising quality um, animals. And I've been around elk hunts since I was two, so or you know as far back as I can remember. And uh, so what I want to talk today a little bit about is the the whole uh, concept that an ancient breeder uh, or an old world breeder has with ancient genetics and the, the goal is to keep genetic diversity and in, in today's world genetic diversity is get is shrunk right down and uh, you could you could kind of uh, relate it to going to an island with about five pairs of dogs and uh, starting in 1950 and not bring any new blood in. And at the end of 2017, what you'd have is some really sick dogs on that island. They would be inbred, they would be line bred, they would be literally all dying off because there's no genetic diversity. You start out with a finite set of genetics when you uh, close the stud book. And old world breeders understood that and they used a full genetic line. And that way you keep the genetic diversity. Now when the 
standards were written for the outcomes. Anya, come on up. Anya, come around this side. Hey, Anya, come on around here. Come here. Come on up here. Get up here. Are you gonna come up there? All right. Good. So when the standards were first written, they had a wide genetic range of dogs. They had a very diverse group. They ranged from the northern part of Norway and Sweden all the way through the coastal areas over to Finland and Russia and Siberia. Those uh, outcomes were a wide range of dogs. Yes, there was the Norwegian types and there was the Swedish types and then there was Tora, come here. Come on over. Then there was Tora, come right here. Tora, Tora, come here. Come here, Tora. Then there was the working dog, like Tora. Tora's the height of genetic diversity, same as Mon and Luna. They're uh, running a, a full genetic package. Now, when the breed standard was formed, it it was pretty clear that they wanted to breed a, a pretty good working dog and use as much diversity as they could. But the breed standard's been rewritten a bit, and it was rewritten to provide for a very uniform look, is really the goal of it, so that they could easily judge in the show uniform genetics. You put Tora in a show with Tecla and you got 64 pounds and 50 pounds, there's quite a bit of difference. And uh, so the judges were having trouble with that, so they rewrote it so that the dogs are measured and uh, to a certain size. They only use one type, and what happens is it's a closed gene pool. It's a finite amount of genetics in that. Now, that's not what the old breeders wanted. That's not what the old breeders were doing. They were using the full genetic material, and so what's happened is you end up with a closed genetic loop by following the show standards. Now, I'm not following show breeders. I'm working with show breeders to keep the genetic variation wide. But at the same time, not all show breeders understand it. Now, we're a preservation breeder, so we use full genetic material. We use every, uh, I don't have black or white or halis horned air alcounts, but I have all three of the others. There's six, there's six types. And so I, I've got three of them. Now, what we try to accomplish when we're uh, breeding elk hounds is, yes, I'm going to have Norwegian dogs. Yes, I'm going to have Jamthun dogs. Yes, I'm going to have Swedish dogs. But at the same time, I'm a preservation breeder, so I've got to keep the diversity in the genetic material as wide as humanly possible. Now, it cost me a fortune to do that because I will go to the farthest, most remote place away from me to get my genetic material, of course. Anya is a prime example of that. Um, we traveled way up to the, uh, come over here, Anya, come by me, come, come. We traveled way up to the Karelian district in northern Finland to get Anya to bring into our program so that we can keep the genetic material separate and diverse uh, from what's over there and it allows us to bring a whole brand new genetic material in. Now, we went and got the very best genetic that we could find. I'm kind of like the little island and went out and found an outcross dog. Now, Tekla, of course, her, her dad is um, out of Norway. So again, totally diverse, uh, all Norwegian lineage, as, as diverse as we could get. Now, our new pretty boy stud, uh, pretty boy Leap, he's again, uh, another very diverse genetic material for us, and that's from the very best of the show world. So way different than our dogs, right? So not even, uh, I mean, he's an elk hound, but he, he don't look like Mon at all. And uh, Mon, of course, is the height of perfection in genetic preservation, because Mon is the true working elk hound that came over here uh, when my grandfather came, this is this is the dogs they came with, and Luna and Tora and that sort of thing. That's why when you look at all the old photos from 1920, 1930, 1940, they all look like Mon. They didn't look like Leaf. They look like Mon. 
and that's because there was a genetic uh, variation in the dog's tor uh, Anya, come on over. Anya, come on over. Here. Good. Luna, you better come say hi. Good. Now, in, uh, in old world principles, what you want to try and do is breed the healthiest dog you can and try not to change the, ge the genetics, try not to change the dog. And so we're not trying to invent a new dog, we're just simply trying to preserve what the old breeders had. That's all we're trying to do. We're trying to preserve a set of genetics so that we don't run into a bind down the road and my kids don't have elk hunts that are strong, that my kids can have a good, solid, healthy dog, and that they've got a working dog that still is exactly like it was when I was a kid. Mon is pretty well the exact dog that we had on the farm. Um, he's, he's almost identical. Uh, Luna is the same, Tora is the same. That's th These are the big dogs that we had. Now Mon, he's, uh, He's starting to be a little bigger than Pretty Boy Leaf. He'll be darker. He'll be stronger. He'll have more muscle. He'll be faster. Uh, he'll hunt better. He'll do everything better just because he's he's uh, not watered down and he's not um, weakened by a shortening up of the genetic material. He's still got a wide reach. Now, the reason Dakota is so powerful, so advantageous to a breeder like me is because he's a genetic um, cross that nobody has hardly. When the old dogs first came to Canada, it was many, many years ago those old Swedish dogs came. Come up here, Anya. Come by me. Come on up here. When the old Swedish dogs came, they came out of some good lines, but they were hard to find, and the association wasn't formed. Uh, they, they weren't breeding the, the Anyas of the world, the Jam Thuns yet. They were still Swedish dogs, and very not that many came. Leif, uh, Eric the Red brought some, but it was usually the settlers that, that brought a dog with them. And uh, they brought them real old, strong dogs, and they brought good dogs. Their dad would would always tell them, we'll take the best pup out of the best female we got and take it with you. No sense going with a sick dog. And so they took the best dog. Now, in almost all cases, in old world principles, that's from the oldest dog they had. And so those genetics were phasing out. When they came here, that's brand new blood, new life, and that genetic material is likely never found again anywhere but here. So Dakota runs genetics that are far different than all the dogs around. Now the breeders have bred on you, they understood my goal. They understood the concept. And they understood that Anya was far distant from Dakota. But both Swedish outcomes, both ancestors back to that early days. And so Anya, her first litter, will be with a, a Jamthund to give us that base of females. Dakota will be then able to have a group of genetic material to work with and it allows us to create that base of genetics here to preserve that base of genetics that has literally been stuck on an island. Um, Leaf, our pretty boy Leaf from the show, the show world's kind of its own island. They're, they're in their own world. They don't bring dogs in. They very seldom import, it's almost always the same breeders, and they use all the same top stud, and in almost every champion dog you can find five or six representations of the exact same grandfather or great-grandfather on both sides of the lineage, so they're, they're already starting to weaken the gene pool. And they hate to sell a dog outside of the gene pool unless they really understand the concept of breed preservation. So yeah, I had to go to the very top breeder in North America to get me an outcross because she understood breed preservation. And the old gal that helped me uh, do this has been in outcross for 25 years and understands the concept as well. Knows the value of working dogs. And because we're so far removed from a show or any show lineages, 
the dogs like a foreign entity to us, so it's a fantastic cross to my dogs. And what it does is, that's the true reason why my dogs are so healthy. I have such big litters, I have so much power. All my dogs are stronger, bigger, heavier, more muscle, better conditioned, is my genetic diversity is much greater. Mon, Mon, right here. Now there's very few guys can sit out in the bush with an elk on like this that would not run away, that would come when called, and have a dog disobedient. Now that comes out of good quality working genetics, and uh, that's what the old breeders had. Now I, I don't unhook on you because there's moose right back here and she's a hunter, and she would go hunting for me today. Now I don't need to be hunting today. So uh, Anya's just trying to stay hooked on. Anya is an ancient gem thund, and the gem thund were in a small gene pool for in the 1920s, 1930s, and they revived that whole breed, and they've done a wonderful job on it. And what they've allowed me to do is help out in some small way, preserve that breed as well. And so the females that we have with Rico uh, are going to be pure gem thunds. Anya is a registered gem thund in Finland, and so is Rico. And so we're going to have pure, uh, really high-end jamthons. And so that allows us to preserve a small genetic pool here in Canada and expand on that pool. And uh, we're the only breeder in Canada that went ahead and, and helped to do that. Now, it's extremely expensive. <laughs> I always say uh, Anya is worth more than my Land Rover. So it's, uh, it's not something that you just do. Uh, you got a plan for it. It took me quite a few years to uh, get organized for that. It took a decade. And so it's uh, not something you just do. Leaf, of course, is very, very expensive. And uh, my breeding imports are, they're, they're a lot of money. And so it's not something you just do on a whim. You've got to really be focused and want to do it. But all the people that buy my pups, you see, they understand the value of strong, healthy dogs. And they're willing to work with me. And the odd day I get somebody that doesn't understand what I do, and that's totally fine. It's hard to explain. And it may take me five videos, because I'm, I'm not a videographer or whatever you call them. Anya, stay by me right here. Just stay right here. Come up here. Good girl. That's my girl. What a good girl. I know you want to go play, but you just stay here. So what we're trying to accomplish today is just talk a little bit more about the genetic variations, the genetic uh, pool, and what a old world breeder is like me, what a preservation breeder is, and uh, what, why I talk about the genetic types, and kind of why I don't show dogs either. Um, obviously, I can't show dogs unless I breed the same type to the same type and both are registered. Okay, I get that they want to keep a fairly unique look for their shows, but at the same time it's it, it kind of steps away from the principles that we talk about in using the full genetic material when you're going to line breed one type. Now, don't don't say that I'm not doing line breeding because I'm breeding jam thund to jam thund Norwegian elk on to Norwegian elk on once I make Tecla with Lee. And so I, I do do it. But it's, uh, it's in a managed, at least somewhat planned out program. i uh, put some thought into it and I've tried to do it in such a way that I preserve the beautiful jam tons, pre preserve the Norwegian elk hounds, but I also preserve the old world elk hound as well. And so I'm trying to um, do the best I can with what I've got to work with. <laughs> it's also, you know, we're talking 5,000 miles to get any of my breeding replacements. So it's not, I just don't go across the street to get them. Um, it took me a whole, you know, it's, it's a long 13 hour flight just from Amsterdam to get home with Anya. And, that's, it was two days northern uh, Finland to get her out of there. 
you know, we're way up equal to Siberia, kind of up in that corner. So, a big job to go get this dog and to find a good dog. You're not early to do all of that and find a poor dog. Uh, I spent a lot of time and, and got the very best that I could get. Leaf, of course, pretty well the very best I could get in the show world. I brought the show world genetics in because they're, they're literally foreign to me. Tecla, of course, is the cream of the crop in the working outcomes. There's nothing in the world that's any better. And Leaf and Anya, these are top of the world dogs. Dakota, of course, in my opinion, uh, still better than all of them. But he's, you know, he's an ancient uh, dog that came over most likely um, 1930s. Some of them old sweet boys, they brought some really good dogs. And uh, when they brought dogs, they came out of that northern Sweden range, and that's where Dakota's from, and he's that big black and just a phenomenal dog. You know, it's it's really a really healthy dog. I mean, he's 10 years old, just sired 10 pups last round, and had another litter with her, and uh, this is a prolific female, so the, the program works, the, the concept works. Now, lots of breeders will tell you <clears throat> that's not the way to do it. Lots of geneticists will tell you there's even more that I could be doing to change things, but I'm one guy. I'm doing what I think is right. Hey, Mon, Luna, come here. Tor, come. Anya, step back in the camera. Anya, step back in the camera. Good. Stay by me. Tora. Tora, right here. Mon, by me. Tora, right here, in the film. Come on, Luna. Mon, get in that film here. I'm filming a video here. Get in the video. What? Right up here. Come on, you guys. All right. So that, hopefully that, that video filmed out okay. All right, settle down. Good. Good. Stay. Well, I guess it won't stay. <laughs> I'm moving. Cool.